Welcome to the Pitchworks Podcast. I'm Scott McTaggart. Over the last 20 years, I've been a sales rep, a marketer, a manager, an executive, a consultant, and an advisor. This show is designed to give you access to my list of contacts so that you can learn more about how to present your ideas at work and succeed in your career. Startups and salespeople, marketers and managers, from the Epicast Network in Pittsburgh, it's the Pitchworks Podcast. We want them to be thinking thermally conductive rubber. We want them to be thinking thubber or a conduct or electrically conductive rubber, you know, when they kind of make those early design decisions. And part of that, like you said, is getting on people's radar, really getting them educated. And that happens, you know, in these design programs, in the kind of the, you know, the, the MBA programs that have that yeah. kind of that tech side to it. Hey, everybody, it's Scott. It is Wednesday, and that makes this your Pitchworks podcast. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. This week, I've got our friends from Arieka, which is a cool materials startup. And you know how I love those. So Carmel and Navid are here, and they're going to talk to you about Thubber. Thubber is quite literally a rubber where you get to pick what its conductive properties are, and that's pretty sharp. Uh, we're all used to rubber where, you know, it's basically an insulator for whatever it is that, uh, you know, you need, you know, you don't want electrical current to come through. you like to reduce the amount of heat that comes through. You use rubber. It's a pretty easy thing. Um, these guys, you know, realized that there are a lot of different ways that products could be improved and, you know, they created a material to, uh, to support that effort. Uh, before we jump into the interview with these two fine gentlemen, you know that I've got to hector and harangue you. I'm going to ask you for all kinds of stuff. Let's just do the whole mix, right? Let's just bust through it. I want rates and reviews. Hit them hit up in iTunes. I want social media. It's Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, company page, all that stuff. Um, if you feel like sending me $5, I would really appreciate that. You know, it's not a lot of money. I think you could spare it. Uh, other than that, I think we should talk to the guys. What do you think? So sitting directly across from me, I've got Carmel Majidi. Sitting to my left, I've got Navid Kazem. These guys, we're going to talk about something complex, but I want to, guys, don't let me nerd out too much, okay? Because, I mean, you could help me do this. You could help me go off the deep end. Go for it. No, 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 no. <laughs> because not everybody feels the same way I do about, like, you know, the future being these material startups. There's some major changes to society on the on the horizon, and things like, and and... Correct me if I'm wrong. Arieka? Arieka, yeah. Okay. I, I want to make sure I was pronouncing that properly. Um, and and it's, it's product Thubber, I think, is, is part of that future. So um, if we can, like, if you feel me going off into, the, into the, the weeds, pull me back and start talking about practical applications, because I think that's what everybody at home is going to want to hear. And then we'll talk about the nerd stuff later after the microphones are turned off. Is that cool? That sounds good, yeah. yeah. All cool. right. So let's get started. You know, beginning at the beginning, what is Thubber? So Thubber uh, is this magic material uh, that has uh, mechanical properties similar to soft silicone. So it's uh, very elastic, it's it's stretchy, it's softer than the skin, uh, but it has thermal and electrical properties uh, similar to metals like aluminum and stainless steel. So it has this really kind of unique combination of kind of mechanical, electrical, and thermal properties. You can kind of think about it like a, almost like a rubbery metal. Right. That's kind of the way I, I picture it. And almost if you actually see it and handle it, kind of comes off like that too it has that kind of you know metallic type of you know color and look to it but you know just as soft and rubbery as a silicone that's interesting um when you add to it the fact that one of the first questions i asked you guys was you know like is this a thing where you're looking for funding or are you actually in the mode where you're selling the product and and i was really glad to hear you're selling the product actively right now who are you pitching to so we are working with like different industries we see like a lot of applications in many different industries, but the main immediate impact we think will be at electronics and also automotive industry, in which we can cool down these heat generating devices as much at much faster rate in much compact areas. I get it. So I just want to unpack this. So it will conduct heat and it will conduct electricity. And some people, I have to believe, will get on board because of one. And some people will get on board because of the other. Right. Right. Um, It just depends on, I guess, like what you're engineering, what you're trying to build. 
Yeah, I mean, exactly. That's right. I mean, so, I mean, we've already kind of put a lot of the work into coming up with the formulation, uh, coming up with the different synth- synthesis techniques. We can tailor the the kind of the composition and the, I mean, if you want to get a little bit into the weeds, like the microstructure of how the different materials no weeds, are. Remember, are you, yeah. I will <laughs> gladly take those breadcrumbs and I will follow them all the way out. All, all right, I'll, I'll get us back on track. Thanks, all man, right. The practical yeah. application. Yeah. I, I've been accused of getting right. too geeked about the material stuff. Yeah, so, so we, can, we can engineer this so it's, either thermally conductive and electrically insulating no or we can make it electrically conductive i was afraid i honestly was going to ask that question and i was afraid that i was going to put you in an uncomfortable position with it right so i'm glad you went there first so the million dollar question how do you sell a material that people didn't put into their original design docs right like that seems like that's the real rub is the fact that they they invented a product and you know, Navid uh, and I were talking headphones a little bit before we turned the microphones on. <laughs> um, and, you know, you put our headphones on and you said, you know, I think Thubber could improve these, right? Yeah. But he, somewhere there's a there's a drawing, there's a spec doc, there's an engineering thing that came out that said, this is how we make headphones. How do you start to make inroads into a new client? So I think this is like where it gets really interesting and kind of like, the nerdy side of me, the PhD guy inside me, kind of like get nourished and like think more about it. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're Dr. Cosm? Yes, I am. And you let me introduce you without it. <laughs> You're a hell of a guy, but I wish I would have. So yeah. PhD behind that name now. Man, yeah. Nice, man. I know. It's been like a week or so. And I'm. Oh, then I definitely <laughs> should have said Dr. Navid Cosm. Thank you. Yeah, I enjoyed, I enjoyed hearing it a lot. So yeah, like this is like where like we kind of like need to work with this larger companies hand in hand, engineers like talking to to each other and kind of like get our material, which can really improve a lot like this current design, these current devices and get them to like work much better and like try to do new things, which can really improve the lives. I think that you're right that you have to start off with the engineer, the person who does the design. But here's where I'm ignorant. I don't know how long people take to come up with a revision to a design. How long does that take? I mean, in the automotive industry, it takes you know five to seven years, right? Oh, wow. I mean, that's really what it takes for you to, I mean, it's a long, yeah. in terms of the supply chain, in terms of getting everything kind of certified and, you know, everybody kind of on board, you know, from your material suppliers to the, you know, to the manufacturers, to the designers, you know, to the assembly plants, you know, to everybody kind of follow along with a new design or right. a new kind of material. So getting back to your point, no, I mean, you know, there, you know, some, there are challenges with kind of introducing, you know, completely new functionalities or new properties that would result in new designs, which is actually why we're trying to, you know, take, you know, things a step at a time. Yes, we do see that with this type of, you know, material, because of the unique combination of properties, it's a rubbery metal. I mean, where have you seen that before? Right. You know, so that kind of opens up new designs, new possibilities. But the, actually, the reality is, and as we've learned, you know, more about practices in the semiconductor industry and in automotives, they're actually using material similar to this right now. Oh, good. So, I mean, even like kind of a hard case electronic device, you know, you don't really think soft and rubbery. But if you kind of pop things open, what you'll notice is that a lot of the kind of, you know, say the electronics, um, you know, in a, in a smartphone uh, or, or just, you know, pop open a laptop or, or a tablet, there are soft materials in there. Uh, and the role they kind of play in the case of heat management is to create basically a way of um, filling in the gaps between different surfaces so heat can transfer from like one electronic component to some other kind of device that can get rid of the heat so that the over, the electronics can so stay it's more cool. predictable. It's a more predictable right. environment in there as opposed exactly. to being voids, which okay, if there's that's voids, if you have like, you know, with these, you know, softer materials, they can kind of fill in those crevices and gaps and get rid of the air pockets, yeah. you know, so you have this more of a kind of a solid kind of, you know, contact between the different surfaces so he can uh, efficiently transfer through. So I know that I'm starting to get into the weeds when I use the word voids. So we're going to, we're going to hit the brakes, <laughs> right? Um, So just sort of spitballing, right? Like, um, it seems that if I were in your chair, what I'd want is as many people trying to invent with the product as I could, 
right? Is that something you've talked about? Like, you know, like having, for lack of a better term, like a hackathon or a, you know, or you could do it in reverse where you take somebody's existing product and try to improve it yourself, right? It, it, I'm, I'm wondering if any of that sort of fun outreach has even become part of the roadmap yet. So I have a lab at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Nice. Um, and uh, in a sense, that's kind of, you know, where we kind of, you know, we do science, but we also hack and, you know, we, we kind of try out new ideas. And so part of developing this material is also uh, been kind of efforts to find applications in maybe not existing kind of, you know, applications, you know, practices right now, but yeah. what could be used kind of in the in the very near future. So wearable computing is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about in my research lab. Yeah. Um, robotics that interface with humans, so human-machine interaction, or robots that mimic the properties of, of kind of natural organisms like soft and squishy robots mm -hmm. uh, that's also something we spend a lot of time kind of thinking about and, and coming up with new ways to engineer them is that because you want to be able to use the conductivity to like be a sensor like i, I i'm yeah. not sure i get the robot thing yet so uh, to, to so let me take it you know a step back right yeah. i mean we want to effectively we want to make robots machines and electronics computing devices that can physically interface with humans. Right. I mean, we want that for, I mean, down the road, we want that for all sorts of applications. Now, the the kind of the challenge, and we kind of see this, you know, not just in the startup company, but, you know, especially in the, on the, the academic side in, in my lab, is we need to engineer the machines and electronics so they have a lot of the same mechanical properties as our human body. Um, so really, yeah. So we want to basically make soft machines. We want to make machines that are soft and squishy and rubbery, just like our natural tissue and our organs. Um, and so that's what really kind of spurred this interest in coming up with new types of materials, uh, in some cases, you know, just finding existing materials and combining them in, in unique ways. In other cases, really, you know, almost from the, uh, you know, from the laboratory level, trying to kind of synthesize and invent new types of materials uh, that had these, uh, both the mechanical properties we're looking for, so materials that are as kind of soft and squishy as your, you know, skin or, you know, muscle or fat, but also have the same type of, you know, ability to kind of conduct heat or conduct electricity like you have in more conventional engineered machines and electronics. And so it, it does seem like there's a lot of opportunity here, right? Because once you can start choosing whether or not to conduct heat and electricity, now you've got fewer steps in, in manufacturing, right? So in other words, like if I wanted something to collect electricity, but also have like a rubbery connector, now I'm talking about like a wire, right? you know, like some sort of meta metallic oh, yeah. conductor inside of it, right? Then I've got a rubbery housing and then I've got a, a, an assembly process, right? And the assembly process tends to be where the expense comes. Yes. Right. Oh, so, for sure. So there's an infinite number of opportunities to, again, go, go a little bit crazy in terms of like, well, how do we use this? Right. And I am the guy who loves material startups, but I think that's honestly where a lot of them get stuck is the fact that people are overwhelmed by how many opportunities there are. It's almost like paralysis by too many choices. And you nailed it. I mean, I think that's one of our challenges, especially trying to translate you know, these inventions from a university lab and get them into the marketplace, right? Because yeah, we geek out on all the different possibilities that can be done with soft robots and wearable computing and all these exotic types of applications, right? But then we get a reality check. The second we do this startup, you know, when we you know, prepare for this startup and go out in the marketplace and we realize that there aren't these soft robots and, you know, these wearable computing and, you know, devices integrating your clothing the way we kind of envision. Yeah. Instead, a lot of things are hard cased, right? Still, even in those kind of more what we think of as kind of traditional or conventional applications, um, there is actually already a kind of a, a important space for these softer and more flexible materials. Um, and you said it, you know, at these interfaces, right? Well, we want to make connectors um, where during manufacturing, it's 
tough to kind of precision align and, and polish and smooth out all the different components so they are flush against each other and, you know, perfectly flat and there's no air gaps. And, you know, the reality is that when you package electronics, you want the circuitry to be flexible. Right. That's why we have flex circuitry, not because the end product is flexible, because you want to stuff as much electronics you can into this, like, you know, into, you know, into this small space. I mean, we see that in smartwatches. We see that, saw that, you know, see that in, you know, digital cameras. Um, um, and so, you know, having rubbery materials is, is also very important. Oh, um, I, yeah. I, I'll make yeah. it very simple, right? I, I'll okay. tell you the first thing I want to build, right? All right. I want to build the iPhone power cord that my kids can't destroy. Like, I, <laughs> because, because I read on your website that it's approaching stainless steel conductivity. Yep. And I went, well, then why are we still using copper inside? Because those things are way more expensive than they should be. And if I just had a little, like a, a run of thubber down, it's only six feet, five feet long, right? right? I mean, it's not like I'm asking for a ton of the material. Hook me up. Um, neither of you has a sales background, right? Neither of you has, has like this marketing and sales thing that, you know, we talk about like every week on the show. Um, but I do sense this sort of verve for presentation. Like I, the, I was mentioning the website, for example. I think the website's beautiful. Uh, congratulations to you guys. Absolutely. Um, where do you feel as though you're like, there's a gap, right? Like that you're going to eventually have to add somebody to the team or you're going to have to learn something more. Like where are the gaps that you feel you're going to have to fill in the future? Yeah, so so we are academics right now, like, and we like know all the nitty gritty of gritty of the materials. And I think this is very important at the earliest stage. We really need to be working very closely and like think more about the scientific and like how this is going to be applied. But we also understand that like the marketing and like com communication and all those things are really important in order for a startup to be a successful startup. Maybe. I, I don't know. There are different models, right? Like you might, I don't know, you might have two years worth, worth of runway in, in the business plan that you've written. Um, but considering how knowledgeable you have to be about the product, right? You know, and, uh, and the fact that so many businesses start with just one or two, maybe three founders, right? It's always interesting. And, and I, I ask this question on behalf of the listeners, because a lot of times people feel I don't know everything. So therefore I shouldn't start anything. Right. And you guys don't have that problem. So I figured I'd ask you just sort of like where your insecurity lies and where you think you're going to have to, you know, patch it up as things get rolling. So some of the things that I think we, we need to like work more to be able to understand these industries much better in details, mm -hmm. like to talk to these these people from this industry and like really understand what are the bottlenecks and what are the problems. And I'm I'm very confident that like such a material, which has not been really around before this, can really help a lot of these problems. And it's just the way for us to be able to get in front of those people, talk about their, their problems and the way that Thubbery can help them. Right. And I do think actually you stumbled on what I would probably give as my first level of advice, which is if you're not salesy, don't try to be right. You know, just attack the problem. Tell people what problem you solve. Right. right. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a solid strategy, especially in this early stage where you may choose to streamline what's available. Maybe being able to engineer the conductivity of one versus the other isn't really what the market wants. Maybe that's too much choice and they struggle to actually sign on the dotted line, right? Yeah. Uh, you still have some... I don't know, market validation to do something. We that, do. Yeah. Right. And, and so, and, and like kind of Navid's alluding to, I mean, what we're doing right now is, is really getting the word out, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, working with companies and, and pursuing um, strategic partnerships, co-development, um, mm -hmm. work with people who actually, you know, work in the industry, right? Yeah. Who have kind of that intimate knowledge and also have the sales and the marketing and their kind of customers and, um, and, and really kind of get plugged into that as opposed to, to try to kind of, you know, reinvent things uh, on our own. So that's kind of the, the approach that, that we're taking. Um, and we take that very seriously, you know, in terms of, you know, you know, working, you know, with, the you know the the you know the, the tech advisors and you know the CTOs right. and and also 
as quickly as possible, try to get those conversations with with the engineers and get these samples over. I mean, we really believe in this this material. I mean, once when you kind of feel it and you handle it, you see, oh my goodness, you know, it's you know just as soft and rubbery as silicone, and it has like this you know thermal conductivity that you know there are other thermally conductive rubbers out there. They're just a lot more brittle and okay. they're a lot more stiff, and that's what currently uh, is being used in a lot of these products. And um, engineers know that that's kind of creating certain limitations in terms of how you know to what extent they can kind of operate these or what for you know what duration or you know yeah. um, you know so how much they can stress their their electronics or, or machines and but so, if you got a big order right now you could fill it yes yes we could so there is this sort of temptation right we to, could right to just sort of run towards dollars yeah you know? <laughs> right and yeah but but it is it is also kind of working with with industry I mean yeah I, I would say that in an ideal world we would just be material suppliers. We would have our website, you know, and we would say, Tempting, we'll right? sell it by the kilo, you know, and, yeah. you Stack know. Stack them and, high and watch them fly. Right. Stack it deeper and sell them cheap. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? You know, so, but, you know, and, and you know, part of it now is, is to kind of create that, you know, in a sense, create that demand. That demand is there when people know what this is and, and how it can really kind of improve the performance of their devices. And we're not even talking about completely new types of, you know, products. We're, we're right. talking about kind of making existing products better in terms of more energy efficient, in terms of uh, a processor that, you know, can last, can run longer uh, without having to throttle it because it's overheating and that could damage all the other components. Um, so so we, we kind of see those, but we're really, you know, at this stage now where we just have to kind of, you know, uh, seriously kind of work on that, those strategic, you know, partnerships and, and you know, pursue that co-development. If I may, right, I, I, I'd like to see if something's possible. And I am entirely out of my element right now, right? But I'm, I'd be curious to see if there is a way that you can sort of average out how long a product goes before they start to re-engineer it, right? So that you're, you're meeting the engineer, you're meeting the product developer at the time of need, right? Because that person, that CTO, that product manager, that person that you want to reach, they're going to have times when they're swamped and they won't talk to you. And they're going to have times when they're very eager to talk to you because they know that the redesign is right around the corner. And I don't know if I don't know, let's go back to those headphones, right? Like if they're constantly in an R and D mode or if, you know, that's, you know, abnormal and every other industry doesn't do that, but headphones does, right? It'd be really interesting to me to find out like, what's the average life cycle of one of the products that you think you can help the most and then start trying to strike like a year before or six months before you think they're probably going to go to an R and D mode. Right. I mean, I mean, from my experience, you know, and, and this is again, going back to, you know, my other life and, and, you know, university, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of how companies recruit and hire uh, from, you know, our students. So we have incredibly talented people. Um, and uh, I, what I've kind of learned is they kind of work on a six month, you know, kind of cycle, you know, and, you know, six months to a year, maybe uh, with a lot of these kind of major electronics companies that are looking to make, you know, personal electronic devices. Yeah. Um, it, you're right. It's not constant kind of iteration on designs. Sometimes but, I'm but, sure it is, but a lot of times is, they can't right. afford that. It yeah. is. It is a bit cyclical, right? But I've seen it as as quickly as you know every six months. You know they they really kind of have their deadlines and you know they kind of push to kind of have that product and and maybe at first it's some internal exhibition and you have this right. you know CEO and you know I won't name names but you know like right. you'll have you know people you've you know kind of you know, heard of, you know, they'll come like, you know, and, Keep and this, try out. drop that, change exactly. this, yeah. lose the headphone jack. Exactly. And they'll just go through like, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, did I give up who we were talking about? <laughs> sorry. I think I may have let the, <laughs> let the secret fly. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. There, there is that you want to kind of hit them at that, at that right time, you know, and, and if you don't hit them, then you have to wait another six months or a year, you know, before they're going to move on to that next, uh, you know, next prototype. Well, idea. the only other strategy that, that feels right to me in terms of just how do you, because I, I always think about how to optimize the resources and people that you have, right? Again, when you have a hundred people in one building, this gets a lot easier because you'll walk through that building and be frustrated at how many people are on their phone instead of doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? <laughs> but when it's the two of you, you're explaining to wives and girlfriends and, and family members why you can't appear at functions and things like you're, you're overburdened right now. And I try to find a way to optimize the time that you've got. Um, so the one idea was try to hit them right before they start on whatever next year's product is going to be. And then, and then the alternative to that would be 
you know, start to really try aggressively to get it in front of people who are getting ready to graduate, right? The people that are going to like, they went to school to develop new products specifically, you know, and I don't know how finally you can target that, but it'd be really interesting if the graduating class of 2019 all knows Arieka and Thubber because you did industry in the classroom, you did, you know, here's some samples, make some stuff. I don't know if that's useful, but at least again, it's a, it's a force multiplier as opposed to trying to touch all of the fortune 1000 or touch 2,500 manufacturers in the, in the world. Yeah. I mean, and that's part of what we do at, at Carnegie Mellon. I mean, I have my research lab or kind of, you know, working with these materials, but tons of, you know, classes through, you know, Tepper, we have a um, kind of institute for kind of innovation and yeah. kind of, you know, uh, you know, tech transfer. And uh, we kind of routinely make materials like Thubber part of the course projects so where we nice. have MBAs and, you know, team up with engineers to kind of see what those market opportunities that's are. Cool. Um, so we're, we're in a sense kind of doing that. As part of getting the word out, yes, we would like to kind of have that, you know, happen at, at more schools and, and you know, and, and really kind of get this material on people's radar. You know, going back to kind of industry and their kind of, you know, cycles and, and their types of timelines. I mean, f- from what I understand of people who work in production groups at, at some of these bigger uh, companies, oftentimes what happens is, up front, they kind of, when they kind of set the specifications or the kind of the goalposts, you right, know, right. just the material, you know, that is kind of something they kind of decide up front. Okay, we're going to use a flex circuit. No, we're going to use something kind of soft and stretchy. Once when they design that, they kind of like put the blinders on and they're not going to down the road say, oh, this new material came along that, you know, we'll kind of consider, you know, switching over, you know. No, I hear um, so you. So you have to kind of get in their head very early on where they're trying to picture and envision what this pro- what the components of this product are going to look like. Because once when they kind of select, we're going to use a thermally conductive rubber versus, they say, a thermal grease, you know, once when they selected a thermal grease, you could have the the perfect, you know, solution, you know, with something like a rubber or polymer. But they don't want to reopen they're not the even think about it. They're not even going to reopen it, right? I yeah. mean, so they're just going to look at all the different incremental, what's the optimal thermal grease out there, right? So we want them to be thinking thermally conductive rubber. We want them to be thinking thubber or, a conduct, or electrically conductive rubber, you know, when they kind of make those early design decisions. And part of that, like you said, is getting on people's radar, really getting them educated. And that happens, you know, in these design programs, in the kind of the, you know, the, the MBA programs that have that yeah. kind of that tech side to it. I then realized that, you know, something we do in the account-based sales universe, which is a whole thing we're not going to get into right now. That's a long, long story. Um, account-based sales, though, uh, is something you probably want to look into. And then you can put a really interesting spin on it. You're probably, to your point, not going to convince them to change what they believe in. However, you can figure out who they recruit from. What school do they like? And then go to that school. And just just propaganda, drop some thubber over top of campus. Be like, there's flyers. We're like, this is the material of the future. Take it with you to wherever you ha- wherever that right. may be that you happen to go to work, right? Um, because it is all about, you know, sort of like what are people comfortable with? And that person who's established is unlikely to go in with something that they feel is unproven. But if all of a sudden 18 kids from Carnegie Mellon show up, say at Thubber, 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 is there a better chance that they're going to be open-minded about it? Yeah. That's fairly like, I mean, we're not quite dark side yet, but it's, we're starting to get a little shady, right? But that's, that's an account based sales kind of an approach where you're like, I want to influence the way people think there. Right. Yeah, and and part of making that happen, yeah, is getting the world out, you know, uh, the word out, you know, being evangelist, you know, for for our product. Um, it's also just making this material available. I mean, yeah. really, people need to have it. It's a very tangible thing. I mean, that's what I love about working in the material space. You know, that's what I love mm-hmm. about this company is you know we're making tangible stuff, and you know, the second people kind of um, you know get this, you know, I think their their mind will just you know you know, start, start going. And, and so, you know, that's, that's something also we've, we've kind of had some early success with is, you know, finding people, you know, who just want the samples that we can go and, and create and, and send, send them out to. Yeah. And I'll get a story about this. Like I had like a person who I've been talking about Thubber, like for maybe month, like up to eight to nine months. And we never had a chance like for him to like come and talk and like play with it and run as yeah. like in a meeting I saw him, I was like, Hey, you gotta come. Like I had a sample like on my desk. I said like, yeah, you gotta come and see this. We have talked about this a lot about the business, and he started just like 
playing with it. And I was like, wow, this is really soft. And like, it and is not brittle yeah. to Carmel's point earlier, yeah. which apparently is what he was expecting. Yeah. And that's like on top of like what Carmel said, it is very important for us to be able to get this material out to like whoever who is interested, like to like to engineers and kind of start feeling and like seeing the difference how how this material will feel like when you are like touching and like when you are playing with it around yeah. and that could be one way of getting to the heads of like those people from the engineers and like getting to the top ranking people the ctos those those, those people who are making those critical and important decisions everyone's trying to get x amount of attention from the audience you know you have it when they are employing two or three senses in checking out your product, right? You know, so the noise level keeps getting higher every single year and it keeps getting higher to rise above it and get noticed. But when you have your product in their hands and you're talking to them about it and they can see it, that's three of their senses. Please don't let them taste it. You know, it's okay if they, <laughs> it's okay if they smell it. Um, then you know you have their attention. And attention is everything in this business. Like when you're starting out with something new, it's not a commodity purchase. It's not like they're going to pick up the phone and say, you know, give me, you know, three shipping containers of steel because they know what steel is and they don't need to feel it. You really need to get their attention. So you guys get big credit for actually having a product. Okay. I'm not, I, I'm not joking, right? Like a lot of the materials folks I talk to, it's very sort of abstract and I, I really appreciate, you know, how much progress you've made already. What is it you need going forward? We need more industry partners. We need to, we need to talk to more people who are like dealing with these problems of like heat management and like get into the nitty gritty of like, what is it exactly? What type of design they need in order to improve the devices that they are now working with. If they are interested in reaching out to you, how would they get a hold of you? Just send an email to info at arieka.com and That's we'll get in touch within the next hour. Info at A-R-I-E-C-A dot com. Correct. And they will get it and, and they want to engage with you if you want to start building stuff with Thubber. That's yeah. pretty cool. That's it, yeah. Guys, thanks for coming in the studio. I hope you had fun. Oh, it, it was, was a great it time. Was, yeah. Thank you so much. All right, that's the end of the ride. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks to Carmel. Thanks to Navid. I, I really think there's something here. Ariak is on to big things that are going to improve a lot of products out there. If you'd like to participate and help them understand a little bit more about the needs of industry, make sure you hit them up at info at Arieka.com. And uh, otherwise, we're just going to make you another show. It's going to come out again next week. Let's call it to Wednesday, and I will meet you there. The Pitchworks Podcast comes to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a production of the Epicast Network and McTaggart, LLC. Engineering and production by Buzzy Torek and Nick Miller. For more information, show feedback, and ad sales, visit pitchworks.com, E-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.com. On social media, find and follow the show on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram using that same brand name, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.